Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome again to Chemistry 101, uh, General Chemistry for Chapter 6 which is Thermochemistry and today we are going to continue with uh, this chapter and talk about calorimetry. So calorimetry is actually a science that is the measurement of heat changes. So the question, we were talking about the first law of thermodynamics which is uh, Q and W. Uh, uh, so the question is how to measure this Q which is the heat in a chemical reaction or a physical process. So the science for this is calorimetry. Now, the device that we are using to, to measure the heat is called calorimeter. And we are going to uh, deal with two types of calorimetry today, which is the constant volume calorimetry and the constant pressure. And the pre previous lecture, uh, remember that we have been talking about enthalpy. And uh, uh, we also mentioned that there are two types, uh, the one at uh, constant uh, volume and at the one at constant pressure. So in the previous uh, lecture, we have talked about enthalpy at constant pressure, where delta P is zero, and also at constant volume, which is delta, U, delta V is equal to zero. And we have proven two uh, very important relationships in this chapter, which is at constant volume, you have delta U is equal to QV. That means the heat that you are measuring at constant volume is equal to delta U. And also we have proven that the heat that you are uh, uh, measuring at constant pressure is equal to delta H. So delta H is equal to QB and delta U is equal to QV. These are very important two rules in uh, thermochemistry. So in a calorimeter, we have also a constant volume calorimeter and a constant pressure calorimeter. Before we go ver further, uh, let's define uh, what is a specific heat. Specific heat, uh, the symbol S for a substance, is the amount of heat, which is a Q, required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So let's imagine that you have one gram of iron, uh, and you want to increase the temperature, let's say, from 20 degrees Celsius to 21. So how much heat you need, that's what is the specific heat, okay? So you want to raise the temperature uh, by one degree from 20 to 21 or from 30 to 31 or any uh, degree to any degree. Uh, so the, the, the amount of heat that you want to supply to increase the temperature for one gram of a substance, that's called uh, the specific heat. Also, we have something called the heat capacity, uh, which is uh, a more general term, term. It's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a given quantity of M. It's not one gram, any quantity of, uh, of the substance by one degree Celsius. So the relationship between the two is that C is equal MS. So that's very important to remember. The heat capacity C is equal M, with where M is the mass, times S, where S the, is the specific heat. So equal, C equals MS, and therefore we can I relate the heat capacity to the Q by saying that the Q is equal actually to C times delta T, or if you sub, if you uh, substitute uh, instead of C uh, S, you can say Q is equal M S delta T, where delta T is T final minus T initial. This is the uh, formula here that we are going to use to solve many problems. Sometimes you are uh, you might need to use Q equals C delta T, and sometimes uh, you might need to use uh, Q is equal MS delta T. Uh, so the specific heat of some substances are shown here in this table. For example, iron has a, a specific heat of 0 0.44 joule gram per Celsius. So it has a, a low heat capacity or a specific heat. And therefore, actually, a, a low value of specific heat means it's easy to uh, increase the temperature. It, it's easy to heat iron and cool it down. So iron uh, cools up quickly and heats up quickly. While water, for example, uh, and you see here, I, uh, water and, and water, ha for example, has a specific heat relatively much higher than everything. Like you see here, aluminum, gold, graphite, they have some uh, numbers for specific heat capacity uh, less than one. But water has uh, strangely, uh, an amazing uh, specific heat capacity of 4.184 joule gram per Celsius, and that means it's very difficult actually to, to cool water or heat it down. It takes so much time for water to, to heat up. It also takes so much time, time to cool down, and this is actually to our benefits 
uh, in daily life. And I will explain this further on later on. What is the uh, anonymous uh, property of water to have a, a high specific heat capacity? Uh, let's take an example uh, to uh, apply this. A 466 gram sample of water is heated from 8 Celsius to 78 Celsius. So I'm heating water from 8 to 78. Calculate the amount of heat absorbed in kilojoules by the water. So S of water is this. So this is a straightforward question. Um, so we can uh, proceed as follows. So here we have uh, T initial is equal to um, 8 and T final is equal to 78. So delta T is equal to 78 minus 8, which is 70. Now, in this case, you don't have to change to Kelvin because delta T, uh, so even if you change the, to Kelvin, let's say you want to change the T initial uh, to Kelvin and T final to Kelvin, delta T would be the same answer because delta T in Celsius and Kelvin, the same thing. So here, delta T in, Kel in Celsius and Kelvin R is the same. Okay, you don't have, if you wanna, uh, if you want to uh, calculate delta T, you don't have actually to change to Kelvin, just to save time. Okay. Um, so we have a grams here, uh, 466 grams, and we have the specific heat capacity. So if you go back to the previous slide, you have two formulas. It's either Q is equal C delta T or M S delta T. Uh, so here you see that it's better to use M S delta T to solve this question. So you can just go ahead. Q is equal M S delta T, where M is the mass, which is four. 6, 6 grams. It's very important here to put the units if you don't make mistakes. And then it's 4.184 uh, joule gram per Celsius times delta T, which is the one you uh, calculated, it's 70. It's always delta T is T final minus T initial, remember. So if you multiply all of these numbers, uh, so uh, so we, as you see here, we have used Q is equal to MS delta T. We put all the numbers and we multiply them all together. And that will give you, because here, um, the grams went with the grams and the Celsius went with the Celsius. So we're good, we are finished with the joules. So the answer will be uh, 136482 joule. It's better to write this in kilojoules. And the answer is one. 36 kilo joule. So that's the thing here. Now, um, the amount that we found, which is Q, is equal to plus 136 joule. Two things about this. First, is that this value here, it's in joules, that means this is the heat, not the molar heat. Sometimes you find uh, heat joule per mole, and uh, and recall that delta H is equal n delta H molar, where this one delta S is usually in joule, and this is in joule per mole, and this is number of moles. Okay, so this is how you go from uh, delta H to delta H molar. Same thing for the Q. Q actually is equal also. Q also equals N Q molar. We are going to use this today, remember, okay? Q, which is the heat, is equal N, which is the number of moles, times Q. What, what is the difference between the two? Is that Q is the heat and QM is the molar heat. The one we have to calculate in this example is the heat because uh, that's what is uh, been asked for. The other thing about this uh, value here is that 
this is a, a plus sign that means it's in it's endothermic and that makes sense because when you heat water okay it was in 8 celsius and you raise the temperature to 78 then uh, you are supplying heat from a heat source so the heat get, uh, went from the surrounding to the system so your water is the system and the stove or the the stuff that you are heating with the device that you are using to the heat is, is the surrounding. So heat went from the surrounding to the system. That means this is endothermic, okay? So that's two things about solving this one. Now, let us talk more about uh, calorimetry. Now, as I said, we have two types of calorimetry. We have something called constant volume calorimeter, and we have a constant pressure calorimeter. First, let's talk about the constant volume calorimeter. A constant volume refers to the volume of the container which does not change during the reaction. So in this case, we have a reaction that is taking place in a container, okay, maybe a box or uh, an instrument, and its volume does not change. So it's a fixed volume. Let's say one liter, that one liter does not change. But however, in a constant volume calorimeter, the pressure might change, okay? And I'm going to explain this in, in, in the next slide. To measure the heat of combustion, let's say, we take a known mass of a compound is placed in a steel container called a constant volume bomb calorimeter. And this bomb calorimeter is filled with oxygen, let's say high pressure of oxygen. And then uh, we also add uh, water to measure the heat changes. So this constant volume calorimeter looks like uh, this thing in the slide. It is made of a stainless steel, a big stainless steel uh, uh, container it's closed from all uh, from all the uh, from all sides okay its volume does not change it has a fixed volume uh, in that bomb calorimeter or we call a constant volume calorimeter, we have we we add uh, some some stuff we add first a thermometer to measure the temperature okay so we add a thermometer to measure the temperature changes we also add a stirrer. A stirrer is just to, you know, move the water uh, around and make sure that we are homogeneous. We have a homogeneous mixture. Here we add the water and the sample. So the water is in this is in this area here, and we add also our sample, the one we need to measure the heat for. Okay. So for example, this sample might be a piece of chocolate or a piece of food or a piece of anything that you wanna uh, measure the specific heat for. Okay. We also have ignition uh, wire. The ignition wire, its job is to burn the sample by uh, having too much oxygen. Now we fill this bomb calorimeter with so much oxygen, usually 15 or 20 or 30 atmospheric pressure of oxygen. So this is basically the calorimeter. Basically, it's a stainless steel uh, container. It has some water on it. And in the water, uh, we put our sample. The sample is not actually in the water. The water is outside. So this area here, it's filled. There is a sample and there is oxygen, okay? But outside this, in the blue area, we have the water. So when the sample is heated, okay, it's burned, uh, the heat goes from the sample to the water. But it does not go out here because this is a closed container. This is like an isolated system, if you remember what an isolated system is. And therefore, by measuring the heat changes in the water, this thermometer will change, will uh, measure the heat, the temperature changes, you can from that know how much heat is evolved. And we are going to solve uh, questions about this soon. But the most important thing that you need to remember is that in a constant volume calorimetry, it's a constant volume, so therefore QV is equal delta U. QV is equal delta U. Therefore, the heat that you are measuring in this constant volume calorimeter is not equal to delta H. If I go back here, to the previous slide, to the previous lecture, we proved that uh, in, in uh, a QV, which is the Q that you are measuring at constant volume, is equal to delta U. It's not equal to delta H. This is not a constant pressure calorimeter. In a constant pressure calorimeter, QV is equal to delta H. But this is not a constant pressure. This is a constant volume calorimeter. That means the pressure inside is changing. Why is it changing? Because when you burn the sample in, the pressure maybe it's 15 atmosphere, but when you burn the sample, the sample will produce gases like CO2 and H2O, uh, CO2, and the, and the amount of CO2 will increase, and therefore the pressure inside this kilometer will increase. And therefore, the Q that you are measuring in this kilometer is not equal to delta H, rather it's actually it's equal to delta U. 
Now let's take an example of this uh, bump granometer and talk together. So it takes a quantity of 1.435 gram of naphthalene, uh, which is C10H8, uh, was burned in a constant volume bump colorimeter. It's very important to read this carefully. Constant volume bump colorimeter. That means the Q that they are measuring from this is not equal to delta H, rather it's equal to delta U. Consequently, the temperature of the water rose from 20 point something to 25. So they have T initial, T final. We can calculate delta T from this easily. If the heat capacity of the bump plus water was 10.17 kilojoule Celsius, calculate the heat of combustion of naphthalene on molar basis. That is fine, the molar heat of combustion. So let's break this down and see what is given and what is required to get. So first of all, we have 1.435 of naphthalene. Sorry, let's mark this number like this. So we have naphthalene. Uh, which is uh, C10H8. And we have 1.435 gram of this, okay? Of course, we can calculate the number of moles of that uh, and find the, we can find the molar mass and, and, and calculate the number of moles, that's easy for us. We have 20.28 uh, is the T initial. And we have T final, which is equal to uh, 25.95. So we can calculate actually uh, delta T from this. We can, you don't have to change into Kelvin in this case, as I said, uh, because it's the same answer. Heat capacity is 10.17, and so C is 10.17 uh, kilojoule Celsius. It's very important to know, to understand the units. So this is C, not S, because if it's S, if it's a specific heat, it will be in Joule gram per Celsius. But this is C, which is the heat capacity, and the heat capacity is in, in units of kilojoule per Celsius. This is heat capacity, not specific heat capacity. Be careful to differentiate between the two. So if the heat capacity is this, calculate the heat of combustion of naphthalene. We need the heat of combustion, V of combustion which is basically Q he's asking about Q okay and then he said uh, and the molar heat he need QM the molar heat of combustion molar heat of combustion that's what is required in the part in the exam so we do we have two uh, formulas that's that's only two formulas that you use Either Q is equal C delta T, that's what, that's the first one, or Q is equal M S delta T. Now you need to decide which one to use. In the previous example, when we hear the author, we used M S delta T because we've, we've been provided with the mass and we've been provided with S. In the previous question, we have provided with this S. But now we are not provided with S, we have C, because the difference between C and S is the units. Now sometimes, by the way, some questions or some books, they do call them something different. But you need to know that this is kilojoule per, Celsi per Celsius, which is mean heat capacity, not specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity will be in grams. So clearly here we have to use this one. The Q is equal C delta T. And therefore we proceed by saying the Q is equal C delta T. Notice that it's Q, not molar. Not molar. We're going to get to the molar soon. So C is 10.17 kilojoule Celsius uh, times delta T, which is T final minus T initial. That means it's 25.95. Uh, uh, It's very important here, Celsius. It's very important here, guys, to uh, use the units in these questions to, in order to know that if the units are cancelling or not. And, th and th uh, putting the units will help you a lot in solving the questions. If you don't put the units, 
something will go wrong and you don't know what's going on and then you're gonna get into a big trouble so uh, q is equal you just uh, do the calculator 25.95 minus this you will find 30 and you multiply it by 10.7 you will get an answer which is 59 55.94 kilo joule see because this Celsius went to the Celsius and now uh, you this this is the answer now the question is, is heat or molar heat is this heat or molar heat this is the heat it's not molar heat because the molar heat is uh, it should be in kilojoule per mole and the question is find the molar heat and we have not used this grams yet as you see here we have not used this grams so that's why he's giving you that so now we need to find this is the heat now we need to find the molar heat so to find the molar heat we apply this q is equal n q molar that means the heat is equal n which is the number of moles times the molar heat uh, from this you can find the molar heat from heat or vice versa so let's find the number of moles first so the molar mass of naphthalene which is this guy the uh, c10h8 uh, C 10 H 8 you, you should know how to find this by now you are in the middle, uh, most end of the course so 12 times 10 for carbon uh, plus 8 which is equal 128 gram per mole that's the molar mass of the and therefore uh, the number of moles is equal mass divided by molar mass which is equal 1.345 gram the, the grams that provide in the process 45 uh, divided by 128 you will get a very small number uh, and then you can find this answer in the calculator and then q or actually you can just leave it as this one so q is equal n q molar that means q molar is equal to q divided by n Would that makes sense now and this one will be that's the q we have found is 55.94 55 divided by uh, the number of moles that you found from the z and you find the answer to be uh, 9 and 4 minus 4 nine nine seven uh, kilojoule per mole you see now we, uh, we 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 have the correct unit for molar heat first we calculate the heat to be 55.94 kilo, uh, kilojoule that's the heat and then we found it to be we divided by the number of moles and we have found it to be uh, four nine nine seven kilojoule per mole there is one thing that is missing in my answer here which is the sign Remember at the beginning of this chapter, we have uh, talked about exothermic and endothermic and uh, we said that you have sometimes to impose the units based on your understanding of the, the question. That means you need sometimes to understand what's going on here. Now here you have a bomb kilometer and you are burning a sample of naphthalene C10H8. You are burning this. When you burn it, the temperature of the water went up, right? So if the temperature went up, is this endothermic or exothermic? When the temperature of the surrounding goes up, this is exothermic process. And that means the Q should be negative. But in our answer, Q is, neg is positive. So that's, for, that's why I'm just going to go here and change this to negative to make it exothermic. And also in my final answer, I want to do this also as negative. So the answer is actually minus 4997 because this is exothermic process and not endothermic. And the way you do this is we have a rule in thermochemistry that says Q of the system is equal minus Q for the surrounding. So the Q that actually I measured here in positive was for the, uh, the system 
uh, and measure effort you want to actually to know uh, the, 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 the energy change of the reaction is equal to minus that number. So just change that to, to minus, indicating this is an exothermic reaction. Finally, this is Q is equal to delta U, the one we found. So Q molar, we found Q molar to be, uh, we said minus 4, 4, and 4, 9, 9, 7, okay? 4, 9, 9, 7 kilojoule per mole. So the question is, is delta U or delta H? Or are they the same? This one is not delta H. This is equal to delta U because this is a constant volume kilometer and therefore Q is equal to delta U. Uh, the bulk kilometer actually uh, is very important uh, in the industry because we use it for uh, we use it all the time to uh, for quality control. So for example, uh, you know, the, the foods uh, that you buy from the supermarket, usually they have something called heat value. It says, for example, this piece of chocolate has 120 calories or whatever. So what we do here is we take that, a sample of that food, let's say the chocolate or the cereal or whatever, we throw it in a bomb kilometer, and then we can measure the heat evolved from burning a sample of that uh, food. And then by comparing it to the label, we can know that this actually is expired food or is it good in good uh, shape or whatever. So this is used widely in the industry to, uh, for quality control, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. For people who are working, who are, or you are pharmacists, uh, uh, you, you actually, um, you, will, you will use this, the bomb kilometer in your industrial. Okay, so let's go, let's continue here. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, a different type of calorimetry now, which is constant pressure calorimetry, which is uh, the one that is most uh, has more application to chemistry actually. In a constant pressure calorimetry, now the pressure is constant. And this is what you do mostly in the lab, because in the lab you're doing reactions under constant pressure. That means the atmospheric pressure won't change during the day too much. And this is used to measure the heat changes like for acid-base neutralization, for heat of solution, heat of dilution, and so on. In this case, the heat that you are measuring is equal to delta H because QP is equal to delta H. This is a very simple representation of the uh, constant pressure calorimeter, and we sometimes you call it coffee cup calorimeter. Coffee cup is the one, the styrofoam cup that you uh, use to drink your coffee or tea. Uh, in this case, the coffee a cup calorimeter is uh, composed of a styrofoam cup, uh, same thing. So there is some water inside as well, okay? There is the stirrer and this is the thermometer. It's very simpler than that. There is no oxygen here. We are working at, at, under atmospheric pressure. So the pressure inside this uh, calorimeter is equal to the pressure outside. Okay, because it's, styrofoam, it's made of styrofoam and uh, the pressure inside and outside is equal. And the way you do this is you carry out a reaction here or you do any type of reaction or a physical process. And you notice that the temperature will either decrease or increase. If the temperature increases, that means it's exothermic. If the temperature decreases, that means it's endothermic. And from that, you can actually carry out some calculations to uh, measure Q. Um, giving the fact that you know the C, the heat capacity. Usually we do this in water, and we know the, the heat capacity of water. So from knowing the change in temperature, we can just say Q is equal C delta T, and from that, uh, we can uh, measure the heat. So uh, when I say heat is equal to delta H, delta H itself might mean many things. For example, uh, when you, when for a neutralization reaction, remember when we did titration in chapter four, for example, when HCl reacts with NOH, it gives NaCl plus water, the heat of a neutralization for that is actually minus 56.2 kilojoule per mole. So you can use the, uh, uh, the constant pressure kilometer, the coffee cup kilometer to measure that value. We have also heat of ionization, fusion, vaporization, and in general, we have heat of reaction. So for all of these types of reactions, we can calculate the heat uh, evolved. 
Okay, so let's take an example of this, which is uh, example 6.7 uh, from the textbook. Uh, on that, um, it says uh, a lead PP cell having a mass of 26.47 grams at 89.89 Celsius was placed in a constant pressure generator of a pressure of 100 grams of water. So we're adding a piece of lead, a metal, uh, at very high temperature to some water. Uh, the water temperature rose from uh, 22.5 to 23.7, so the temperature of the water uh, increased a little bit. And the question says, what is the specific heat of the lead pellet? So let's uh, break down this, uh, this question here and see what's going on. So in this question here, we have a piece of lead, it uh, has a mass of 26.47 uh, grams, and it's hot, so the T initial for the lead is 89.98 uh, gram, uh, Celsius. Uh, we're putting this in water. The water is cold. It's uh, the T initial was 22.5, and because of the piece of the lead is hot, the temperature of the water increased a little bit, 20, uh, up to 23.17 uh, degrees. Celsius. We are also provided with the uh, amount of water. We have 100 mils, and uh, because the density of water is one, then 100 mils will equal actually 200 grams. Now, to understand what's going on here. Uh, when you put a piece of lead into water and the lead is hot and the water is cold, the temperature of the water will increase and the temperature of the lead will decrease. And if you want to think about this, then you have a lead, uh, a hot lead, that, uh, the temperature of it will decrease, so the temperature here will decrease, and the temperature of the water will increase. And if you think, now here you can consider your system either the lead or the water, it doesn't matter. But if you consider your system as the lead, then the temperature of the surrounding will increase, and that's what and that's what exothermic means. Because here you are, the heat is going from the lead to the water, so the lead is losing heat, so minus Q here, and that heat will go to the water. So this process is exothermic for the lead, but it's actually endothermic for the water. If you consider your system as the lead, so let me here explain this further. So for so what does actually endothermic and endothermic means? So if you have a system and you have a surrounding, okay, and if this system is losing heat to, to the surrounding, that means you have a minus Q here, the surrounding will take that heat and therefore the temperature of the surrounding will increase. And that's what exothermic means. When you do an, when you carry on an exothermic process for a system, you're expecting the temperature of the surrounding to increase. And that's what we feel when we add, let's say, a small amount of sodium hydroxide to water in the lab. We feel the beaker to be warmer, to become warmer. That's because the temperature of the surrounding increases in an exothermic reaction. So this is for uh, exothermic. Now, for endothermic reaction, it's totally the opposite of what is happening, okay? So, for uh, an endothermic, you have a system and you have a surrounding. And in this case, the heat will go from the surrounding to the system. So, minus Q here, uh, plus Q here, okay? So, this is endothermic because the system here, uh, we are defining endothermic for the system. And, and therefore, the temperature of the surrounding actually will decrease. So if you, back to, if you go back to our example here, what's happening here, it doesn't actually mean, it doesn't actually uh, matter which one you consider your system or your surrounding, but what's happening here is you have a heat transferred from the lead to the water, and therefore the lead, the lead temperature decreases, the lead of the water increases. This is exothermic uh, for the lead, this is endothermic for the water. So the way you solve this, actually, uh, you, you can do two approaches. Uh, you can say you can start by saying that Q uh, lost by the lead should equal to minus Q gained by water. Now this plus and minus you can just uh, grab it from here. So Pp is minus uh, water. Even if you can, if even uh, and minus is for water, 
Even if you uh, want to flip these signs, you should get the, uh, the correct answer, but one should be uh, plus, one should be minus. Uh, simply, we always say Q uh, lost should equal minus Q gained. Or you can say minus Q lost is, is equal plus Q, Q gained, whatever, but one should be uh, plus, one, one should be minus. And if you want, and because we are uh, supplied by the specific heat of water, then we can use the formula, which is ms delta t for the lead should equal to minus ms delta t for the water. You can uh, do this in one step or two steps. So I'm going to solve it. Uh, so I'm going to solve it both ways. So answer A for this. Like this is uh, one way to do it. Is you go and say uh, first let's calculate the uh, Q of water. So Q of water here is equal m s delta t, which is equal m here is the mass of water, which is 100 mils. That's 100 grams multiplied by the uh, specific heat of capacity of water, which is 4.184 gram uh, sorry, joule per gram Celsius multiplied by the T of water uh, which is K, which is this case a T final minus T initial for the water it's uh, 25 23.17 minus 22.5 so uh, 23.17 minus 22.5 degrees Celsius and that will give you uh, the, the heat gained by the water, which is plus uh, 283.2, so 283.2 joules. Now you uh, go back to your formula here, that the, water, the heat of the lead is actually minus of the, of the water, and therefore you can say Q for the lead, is equal minus that value, so it's minus 283.2 joules because the lead has lost some heat. And that's equal to ms delta t for the lead. The question says, the question is asking about the s for the lead. Uh, we know the mass of the lead. We also know the delta t for the lead because lead has initially gone from uh, 89.89 Celsius to a final temperature that is equal to the final temperature of the water. Because when you put this with this, when you put the lead with the water uh, and you wait some time, uh, they should uh, reach a thermal equilibrium where the final temperature is equal to for, both, both, for both sides. So here uh, you go back and then just carry on with the question. And you say that uh, minus 283.2 joules is equal M for the lead. Uh, 26.47 26.47 grams and multiplied by S for the lead which is the one we don't know times delta T which is T final minus T initial and T final for the water which is for the lead is 23.17 minus 89.98 Celsius And you see this part here is actually is negative, and that's why uh, the negative sign here goes with the negative sign, and, that, and we obtain a positive uh, uh, specific heat. So again, uh, when you subtract these numbers, the temperature delta T here, you will obtain a negative number, and that should go with the negative number to the right side, to the left side, and you will obtain a specific heat uh, uh, of plus uh, 0.158. Uh, joule and gram per Celsius. That's the answer for this question. And specific heat is always positive. So specific heat, uh, most likely it's positive, okay? So this is how you do this question. The other way to do this question is you can simply do it in one step. So you can say answer B here is you say uh, MS 
delta T for the lead should equal to minus MS delta T for the water. Uh, this minus should be, okay, you can switch this, you can say minus MS delta T for the lead is equal to MS delta T for the water, it also, it also works out, but the minus should be in one side of the equation. You can uh, just throw the numbers here, so the mass of the lead is, uh, uh, the mass and the specific heat is unknown, uh, you just, uh, okay, so let me do this for you. So 26.7 grams times the S of the lead times delta T, which is T uh, final minus T initial, that's 23.17, minus uh, 89.98 Celsius, should equal to minus 100 for the water grams uh, times uh, 4.184 joule uh, gram Celsius times delta T for the water, which is tw 23 minus 21. So 23.17 uh, minus 22.5, 22.5 Celsius. So you see here, uh, all the sides are numbers, okay? Uh, again, the negative sign to the right will cancel of when they get the negative side here in the delta T, and there is one unknown for this equation, which is S. You can also do it this way, so you can do uh, you can do it in either A or B, and I hope now that you understand uh, how to solve this question. So the most important thing that you need to remember is that uh, for this question is that the heat loss is equal to the heat gain. So one will be positive, one will be negative, and you just work your okay. And the last question in this lecture here. So I'm just gonna close this. Is this question? In this question, uh, it says one times 10 power two milliliter of 0.5 molar HCl was mixed with the same amount of NOH. Uh, in a constant pressure kilometer, so again, uh, this is a constant pressure. Uh, the initial temperature of the solution was 22.5, and the fact, so we are having uh, T initial, T final. Calculate the heat change of neutralization of reaction in a molar basis. Assume that the densities in specific heat of solution are the same for water. Okay, so we have NOH and HCl mixed with that. This is also a straightforward question. And uh, we have HCl. And NaOH, we are mixing this together, and we have 1.0 times 10 to the power 2, that means 100 mils, okay? 100 mils of that, and 100 mils of that. And they are both 0.5 molar. Remember the molar number of moles is m times v, so we can calculate the number of moles of this. This is also 0.5 molar. When we mix this together, the, the temperature went from 22.5, that's the temperature initial, it went up to a 25.86. So this is exothermic reaction, okay? 25.86. So the temperature increased, that means it's exothermic. The temperature of the surrounding increases. And he says calculate the heat change, Q. He wants Q for this reaction. Because we are working under, under constant pressure, then delta then actually Q in this case is equal to the pH. When I ask you what is the heat change or what is the enthalpy change, because this is constant pressure, it's mentioned that in the question, because this is constant pressure, then delta Q is equal to the pH. So here we have a solution of HCl and NOH, and he said, uh, Consider this as, as uh, the heat capacity is equal to the heat capacity of water. So we know the heat capacity of water or the S of water. S is equal to uh, 4.184 uh, joule, uh, sorry, joule per gram Celsius. We know that number. Then we can apply the rule, which is Q is equal to MS delta T. But the mass here that we are considering 
would be the mass of both of them because we are mixing 100 mils of that and 100 mils of that and there is a, a heat change for all of them then uh, it should be the mass that the mass of both solution both uh, substances the hcl and the noh which, or you can actually uh, calculate uh, each one of them separately and add them up and because 100 mils of hcl is 100 grams because he said that density is one then the q is equal 100 plus 100 that's the two of them times s which is 4.184 times delta t of course you have to put the units but for the time being i'm not the 25.86 minus that's t final always minus t initial 22.5 and when you do the math uh, you will find the answer to be uh, 2.81 kilo joule. Now here, this is a grams, this is joule, a uh, gram per Celsius, and this is Celsius. So the Celsius goes with the Celsius, the grams goes with the grams. You will find the big answer, of course, 2,000 something. I just changed it to uh, kilo joule at the end. The question says, if you go back to the question, the question says, calculate the heat change for the neutralization uh, on a molar basis. When he says that, that means he needs actually, uh, this is a Q, this is the heat. This is the heat. When he says molar basis, that means he needs the molar heat. So we need QM now. So again, we can apply Q is equal NQM. Uh, so molar bases, if you go back to the question, there's two, two things reacting here. We are very lucky in this question that we have equal amounts. So the number of moles here, number of moles of HCl is equal M times V, which is equal 0 0.5 times 0 0.1 liter. I will change it to that to liter, so that's 0 0.05 mole, moles. And same thing here, because we have equal amounts. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is uh, it could be limiting, but we are lucky now we have equal amounts. That means one mole is equal, uh, is, uh, it's one to one. So you can use either one, and therefore, number of moles is equal to 0 0.05 mole. And then QM is equal to Q divided by N. That means it's equal to 2.81 kilojoule divided by 0 0.05 moles. And the answer will be uh, minus. Now we understand what I'm doing to find 56.8 uh, kilojoule per mole. Uh, now I, I sh you should understand why I think it's to minus because always, also this Q actually should be uh, equal to minus. And the way you do this, you say you can say Q for the system is equal to Q for the surrounding, and you just change your answer to minus. In this case, also uh, Q molar is equal to delta H molar. That means delta H for neutralization is going to be equal to minus 56.2 kilojoule per mole. So thank you for listening so much for, uh, so much for this lecture and uh, I wish you uh, you having a beautiful day.